Welcome, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to another edition of Bottom of the Bill. This week, we have John Harrington on the podcast. John Harrington is a guitar player for Steely Dan, and he's done. He's worked with everybody, Bette Midler. I mean, he's worked with literally everybody. It's an amazing conversation. You get to pick his brain on his role as a side guy in these projects, but then also him being a band leader and an artist in his own stuff and just exploring those dynamics and finding your voice as an artist and a guitar player as well. Um, really insightful stuff from him on this. But before we go into that, we just want to tell you that, again, we have Bottom of the Bill merchandise. It's available. Link in the descriptions. Um, and also, if you're enjoying what you're hearing, you guys are liking the conversations, please share, like, subscribe, let people know what we got going on here so we can help grow this community and shine a light on more of our friends and and musicians here in Jacksonville trying to grow this thing. So without further ado, here is John Harrington. This is... Bottom of the bill. John, is it Harrington or Harrington? How do you say it? Harrington. 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 Yeah. Um, it's a really a, a pleasure and honor to talk to you, man. Just the amount of work that you've accomplished in your career, you kind of have, it seems like this perfect in between that a lot of us are are chasing this kind of like you're an artist but you're also like the this go-to side guy for some of the greats and you've recorded uh you do session work you've released books like you're this full spectrum entrepreneur <laughs> and i think that we're all trying to strive to exist in that capacity in some way or another so i'm just curious you know what's your journey been up to this point i, I want to get into all this stuff it's been amazing well, thank you. That's very flattering. <laughs> I mean, I, uh, it doesn't always feel like that to me, but sure. Uh, but I appreciate that. Um, yeah. Well, it's. I mean, the the big explanation for me is that I've had a lot of years <laughs> to do this stuff. So, you know, I'm I'm no youngster anymore. So, uh, although I think I think this work kind of keeps keeps people young. Often it feels like that for me. But yeah, I've had a lot of time, so um, you know, uh, it's been a long journey, and there's been plenty to do. I've been lucky enough to have a lot of great opportunities, and uh, when there haven't been any, I've often managed to come up with, uh, you know, the the sort of the somehow the the motivation to you know to make something happen myself. You know, when when it wasn't. When the world wasn't screaming for my, uh, you know, <laughs> participation, you know. right? And I'm curious. So I'd like to kind of dive into some of that because there is this aspect of being an artist and a musician where you kind of have to be willing to pivot. There's like this creativity kind of in figuring out that next thing that I think is very relatable to being a musician in the same way that you might compose or that you might be improvising or whatever it might be. There is also this improvising in your career. Uh, I'm curious as to where that some of that drive might come from because there's so many artists and musicians, as you I'm sure know, that just don't have that in them where you know if the gig isn't there they're they they might just starve you know yeah well i mean there's no question that that for me and i think for a lot of people it 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 helps to sort of be hungry you know i mean and and when i was younger you know i had no choice i had to find work somehow and the only thing i felt like i could do that was even mildly unobjectionable you know <laughs> like uh, <laughs> um was was music because you know I, I mean i mostly i did enjoy it but you know i had to do a lot of gigs that i didn't enjoy and but you know i was happy to be able to be doing music and you know not the busboy job i had as a teenager for probably a weekend or or picking strawberries <laughs> for a couple of weeks in the summer you know i mean that, that definitely uh i was convinced that it was worth persevering to, you know, to be able to, you know, to try to connect my livelihood with something I, you know, loved. But I, th I think it can really be helpful to, to sort of need to work, you know. And then often, you know, you, you when you get out of school, I mean, school is a funny time because, you know, there's there's sort of a path that a lot of people sort of can can feel that they're on. And like, you know, it, 
you, you do what's expected of you. And, but when you get out in the real world, especially if you're a musician, you know, you have to work and there, there usually isn't a lot of choice and you get, you take whatever is offered wherever you are. And, and then from that moment on, I think the world begins to help define you for yourself, you know, you, and you realize if you're smart and you want to succeed, you're going to have to let that happen to some degree. It, you know, it's time to let go of a lot of those fantasies and say, okay, well, this is the kind of work I'm being offered and they like me enough to call me again for it. I guess, I guess, you know, this is a sign, you know, or if you get a job that you hate, you know, because you respond to that and you, you know, run in the other direction as fast as you can and look for something different. It, it, it's a motivator. So the world seems to help. I mean, when you get out of your room and you, the, you, you can let go of the fantasy of whatever it is and, and start to deal with the reality of, of, of your you know, life in music. And it's, you know, a lot of that is, is, is work, the kind of work that you end up doing. So, so for me, you know, it was, um, there were a funny, a, a just funny circumstances uh, that ended up being opportunities that you never would have expected. I never would have expected. I would never sort of recommend this. But for instance, there was, uh, I was, after college, I was kind of lost but living around New Jersey, not far from where I grew up for a while. And then just kind of beginning to get a little work in New York, but not much. And uh, wasn't really ready to move into New York. And um, it, I just sort of felt like a little aimless. There wasn't a lot of work and uh, just didn't look like anything was happening. So I, I just weirdly said yes to an invitation to move in with a, a girlfriend who I had seen for a while and who had just moved back to Indiana in Indianapolis. So I, I made this weird radical move to Indianapolis, Indiana around 1980. And um, I would never have thought that that was like a, oh, that's a great thing to do for your musical career. I would never have expected that. It, but it absolutely was because within, within a few months, I had met a lot of great musicians who, because it was Indiana, not like a competitive marketplace like New York or LA or Nashville, they they were welcoming and you know they they weren't uptight and they weren't threatened and they were they were welcoming uh, somebody who could play in a bunch of styles and so w within a couple of months i was i was getting all kinds of work jazz work in some jazz clubs um with some really good players local players there and uh, studio work because there was sort of a a scab non-union jingle scene and uh, a couple of studios that did uh music that was uh you know was kind of christian music and uh but they they would do orchestra sessions and stuff like that and so it was sort of a like the perfect training ground for uh, a whole a whole wide variety of music making that that if i had had to do that in new york i probably would have never never had opportunities like that repeated opportunities and the, you know, the, because the the sort of standards are so high and the and the sort of the competition is so fierce, uh, I probably would if I got a call, I probably would have fallen on my face and had to wait another ten years before I could give it another try. You know, so this was, I mean, but who knew? I mean, I, I would never have, and I still wouldn't recommend. Oh yeah, you should move to uh, you know Columbus, Ohio, or something. I would never recommend anybody do that. But for me, I think it was because again, this is the point. Like that because I was able to respond to whatever opportunity was there, um, I, I made the best of it. And um, it turned out to be, in hindsight, like a, like a great move. But who, you, know, you never know this stuff. You, you, you kind of just, you have to sort of trust that your responses are going are gonna to help you. you know? and, and if there were nothing happening there and uh, I couldn't get, get any music work, I mean, I, I, I suppose I might have tried some other kind of work for a while, although I have no idea what it would have been. And then, uh, and then probably I would have looked elsewhere if, if nothing panned out, but it was a fabulous opportunity. And for, so I was there for three or four years and, uh, met all sorts of great musicians who, who finally moved to New York and I'm still working with and still in touch with. So it was, that's very cool. So it's weird, but, um, like I said, you'd never, I'd never say, oh, this is the formula because it's not a formula. It was just the ability to react and, and respond you know, creatively to to whatever 
the world throws at you. So right. Yeah. yeah, we we talked about that a little bit on our last podcast, uh, where this idea of people trying to like kind of sell you on how to make it in the music industry or how to like, <laughs> and you know the, the your top five ways to make money off your music and blah blah blah, and you know I think even if you speak to some of the 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 most successful artists out there, they're probably not going to be able to tell you exactly how it happened because it's just kind of like a crapshoot as to what works and what doesn't, you know? And it, yeah, you, you have to find your way, and, and your way is not like anybody else's. I mean, exactly. I mean there's always somebody trying to sell you a, a plan, you know? <laughs> right, <laughs> right. For, those sound like, you know, you see ads for those kinds of things all over the all over the Internet, of course. But uh, but no, I, th I, I think, um, you know, I, but, I mean, there are, in some general ways, I mean, there are things that, you know that seem like good ideas it's a good idea to be somewhere where there's music happening i sure. mean like you know it's hard to do this or uh you know in a remote location where there's not much you know music to go here and other players to meet or else you kind of you know you sort of force yourself into this online universe which is kind of vast and which is sort of the 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 case for a lot of you know fantastic young musicians but but it's a little weird and it's and and um i don't think it's the most satisfying way i mean for me it wouldn't feel satisfying to work that way like all alone i mean i had to do it in, during the pandemic but <laughs> but thank god we you know we don't anymore and so it seems like you know you, you want to find a place where you can discover a community you know yeah 100 uh, percent. because I, i've never had a job that hadn't hasn't resulted from somebody saying oh call john you know like who, who'd heard me who knew me we say oh yeah just call john you know he, he can do it you know and you know you don't get it from selling yourself you don't get i mean it all comes through word of mouth at least for me all my work has just been somebody heard about me from somebody else who had played with me or heard me or something like that you know it's there's no there's no formula for it it's it's just it's it's networking with people i think you know and, and playing with other people so that seems to that's that's a good general bit of advice i think just like find a, a place where you can discover community for yourself yeah you know, sure. like-minded musicians really what you want you know totally it, for me it took a long time i mean i had a, i had an extraordinarily lucky call you know when i was recommended for uh that first Steely Dan session I did, which was 23 years ago or something like that, and maybe 24. And um, I had been in New York for a long time uh, and and not doing particularly wonderful work, you know, from my point of view. I was, I was managing, but I was saying yes to every possible gig, playing Broadway shows, playing, you know, little pickup gigs with, you know, original music pop bands, uh, trying to do work with my own little band, just everything I could do, to, teaching, you know, everything I could do to try to just make ends meet, because I had a daughter who liked to uh, eat every day. Yeah, imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's my favorite Jimmy Ponder joke. <laughs> he told me that once. Um, yeah, so, um, but, you know, it took me a long time. I mean, I, for me, uh, the, having luckily been recommended for to work with Donald and Walter, and then having to get to know him and uh, those guys and and the rest of the band. I mean, I, I did finally feel like uh, I found a sort of a community of like-minded musicians, you know, with the same sort of sensibilities and who like to work a certain way, and you know. Uh, you know, just with certain musical taste and, and preferences or something. And uh, you you can be in a place for a long time before you find people like that, you know, because there's a lot of a lot of people in New York, but but very few who I, I feel like, you know, a real musical connection with. You know? there, there's a, it's a small number. And uh, the idea that, that, that over time you can sort of discover those people you know it, it it often takes time i guess is my point it, it really took time for me i mean i had a few close friends even when i was first in new york but before there be, became a big enough network to actually support me you know with and to sort of for me to begin to be able to say no to the gigs that weren't to my taste and to say yes to the ones 
and to have enough of the gigs that I enjoyed to sort of, you know, that, that was a complete game changer for me. And that, that really didn't happen until uh, around the year 2000 or so it began to change. But I'd been in New York for, since 84, you know, so that was, wow. a, that's a long time. Yeah. You know? You know, there's got to be this. on the tuxedo on the, you know, on the weekends to, you know, sort of, you know, play the bar mitzvah in, on Long Island, you know. Right, like, right. This is, this, I had to do that. And, and some of that was great, actually. I met some great musicians doing that because a lot of people are in the same boat. You know, so. Well, it's also interesting about some of those corporate and wedding style gigs where you're playing pop music and it's got to be pretty on point. So not to say that there's not some hacks that kind of circulate that that scene but there's also you know some of the best musicians that i know are in that circuit as well it, you know it can be done very well i mean or it can be done and, and you know I, I i had a that was a huge learning experience for me because i remember I, I got a job i got a job as a sub uh for uh somebody who couldn't make the gig and it was a club date band you know just one of those standard you know that's, at least that's what i thought and um i went to do the gig and you know i'm, I'm sitting there kind of almost in a fetal position sitting on my amp you know and like kind of like my legs crossed just like kind of not wanting to be there you know <laughs> and just, but but playing as well as i could but just not interested in, in the scene and, and looking like i was miserable i'm sure yeah but um uh, so i and i'm looking around like at the at the band and i'm seeing everybody else in the band you know is up there they're, they're they're playing. It's like they're playing their hearts out, and they're having a ball. You know, they're bouncing around, dancing, like laughing. It's just, just really like in it. You know, and I'm thinking, like, what's wrong with these guys? Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is what it, something wrong here. Like, because, because you know, and ultimately, I, I found out there was nothing wrong with those guys. There was a lot wrong with me at right. that time. You know, I was just thinking, you know, oh, I'm better than this. This is not for me. You know, like, what is this? Uh, you know, this is. Let's just phone it in and not, you know, not really be there. Well, I I couldn't have been, you know, luckier uh, in, in hindsight that like it, the difference between my behavior and and everybody else's was so radical that I it, it sort of forced me to th like wait a minute <laughs> something's wrong here something's not quite right and you know eventually I realized that, first of all these these guys were fabulous musicians and and they also just weren't full of themselves like I was, you know, right. they were just having a ball. And, and that's a much better way to go. I figured that out. It took me a while, but uh, but I learned. So that was one of the greatest gifts I could have had. So, you know, like I said, if you're able to respond to the world, you know, it, you know, it will give you opportunities to do to do so if you if you're if you're awake. You know? Yeah, I, yeah. I was I was kind of asleep, but but that woke me up and thank goodness I, I could respond, you know, but um, yeah, it's, so you got to change me. I'm not like that anymore, so which is great. <laughs> yeah, you got to be willing to receive. I feel like you know, and that's and then once you're willing to receive, just the information will start to make itself aware to you in some capacity or, or another, you know. All right, guys, this episode's brought to you by Best Buds CBD Store. If you're like me, maybe THC isn't always the right high for you. Or maybe the legal status of THC has you a bit hesitant to indulge. So at Best Buds CBD Store, they have an array of CBD and Delta 8 THC products. These guys truly care about their service, so everything is meticulously sourced and prepared to deliver a top-notch product and experience. If you head to their website, you'll find all kinds of educational information regarding Delta THC and CBD. Uh, not to mention if you use promo code BOTBPOD, that's B-O-T-B-POD, you'll save 10% on your order. This is not a one-time deal. If you use promo code BOTBPOD, every time you place an order with Best Buds, it will give you 10% off. That's in perpetuity forever. So head over to bestbudscbdstore.com and start saving on all of your CBD and Delta A products. Enjoy, guys. I was curious. I, I was going through your bio and, um, you know, talking about, playing some of these corporate and wedding pop gigs and stuff. It says that you kind of had an interest and a draw towards pop music and started wanting to get involved in that vein. But you also have this extensive background in schooling and, you know, you've done a lot of the jazz gigs and you kind of, you know, were in that world as well. What drew you to the pop realm as opposed to kind of going full, 
fledge into the uh, into the jazz world, which so many talented musicians go that way instead of the other way, you know? Yeah, I mean, I sort of have the curse of, of like, loving a lot of different music, you know? I just, uh, I have wide-ranging tastes, and uh, and I, th- I think for a long time I felt that that was sort of, that might be problematic, um, because I, you know, when I think of all my sort of, idols and heroes you know um musically speaking you know um most of them are specialists you know they're, they're, they they only do one thing and they just do it unbelievably well you know but but i actually over time i realized that this, this wasn't i didn't feel like this was something i could choose and so i think you know you're, you're sort of stuck with the, the personality that you have you know and I explored, you know, I, I'd spent a good 10 years, like, you know, not bending a string so I could try to learn to play jazz on a big jazz box. You know, I sold yeah. my gold top Les Paul in my PA system and bought a big, you know, f old Johnny Smith <laughs> guitar, you know, tried to do that. And I think that kind of immersion is necessary if you're going to even get in the game at all with a style that's as difficult as that, because it is. There's a lot, of, a lot of discipline involved and a lot to learn. And for me, I was, I was a real beginner when i began that so but that never felt like the only thing i mean i i I, it it always felt like a sort of an adopted tongue in a in a funny way because my original my original uh musical personality i think was formed as a kid and as a teen you know and i mean i grew up on on the beatles basically and uh that was that was the most powerful sort of young musical influence and inspiration for me and then it was, you know, sort of, it's sort of the British invasion rock was was just my passion, you know, and uh, uh, you know I loved Cream and Hendrix and you know the Who and you know all that fantastic music from that time, which felt so original and uh, and vital for me. And and it was so guitar based, you know, right? Um, that it was great. So my pop sensibility is the most basic one, I think, to me, you know. Uh, but you know, when I went to school, um, even the first day of school, I met I met people, some some who were good friends still. Uh, the first day, who were you know sort of disciplined on their instruments, and I wasn't. I at the time I played guitar, piano, and saxophone equally poorly. I'd say you know, so it was a kind of shot in the arm for me. Like I said, oh, I, I guess I better get serious here. So the way I decided to get serious was to uh, study. To pick guitar as the main instrument I wanted to work on, but also, uh, you know, I, I took some classical guitar lessons and I took some jazz guitar lessons, and it just felt like the jazz world connected more to to my uh, natural uh, proclivities and also my my background. Since I mean, like Stevie Wonder's tunes, you know, had like cool jazz chord changes in them, and like I I was like, what's that? I got I want to know what that is, and I love classical music, but it just didn't seem to connect to like playing electric guitar and and the music I'd grown up on. So, right. so the jazz thing felt like okay, if I'm going to learn more music, this this would be a sensible place to to do it, you know. And like I said, you can't really you can't dabble in jazz. You have to you have to d- dig deep and immerse yourself. I think to to even figure out what it's about definitely and even get close you know so it took a long time and i i was kind of committed to that for a while but when i when i got out of school and after a couple of years realized that you know i might be following in my teacher's footsteps and and doing gigs for 30 bucks a night you know and teaching 60 students a week just to make ends meet and that may be all that it, that it offered I, I started realizing when I went to Indiana that like, oh, well, there's a call here for this this weird range of skills that I have because, uh, you know, not only do I understand chord changes and jazz a little bit, but I, 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 I knew rock guitar, I knew blues guitar, I knew some country guitar. I mean, I had, I had some other, I had an acoustic guitar and an nylon string guitar. So I, I realized I was, because of my... Because I was not like a specialist, but I had a wide range of tastes and I had a reasonably good knack at, at kind of, you know, playing what I heard. I, I realized that, oh, well, 
this is this this like sort of this studio thing feels like a oh that might be a good fit for me because I can kind of do it and and so the world in Indiana at least said yes to me that way and uh, I, I got all sorts of opportunities like that and a lot of experience so uh, like I said I finally just gave I gave up worrying that I wasn't a specialist and just decided that like you know. I can't help it. I'm, I just I wouldn't have felt right only doing jazz. Some people have no choice. That's all they want to do. That's all they can that, that can invest in. That's all their hearts in. But my but I love all sorts of music. And uh, when I decided it was time to like record some music, write and record some music of my own with my own band, I just tried to be natural about it. And for me, what was natural was mostly that those early influences of of like british invasion rock and the beatles and and then there was as a player i think there you know i, I tried to make room at least on some of the work i did the records we, we made um try to make room for some of that some of the influence of, of jazz that had gotten into my playing and that you, know, you can hear i think if if you listen even though it's not a jazz sound uh there certainly is. There's something about the the approach to playing lines and improvising that, that that I certainly you know have been influenced by that world, and I and I love that. A lot That's, of your phrasing, I noticed, is is you can you can hear where it comes through in the phrasing, for sure. Like it's not so much you know harmonically, but I've noticed it's just the way you approach playing your lines. Where you're like, this guy definitely has that influence for sure. You know. Yeah, I, I think it's, I mean, a lot of that training that I did, f which was from a jazz perspective, uh, I think freed me up on the, you know, to, to sort of play less hands first and more head first, if you know what I mean. Totally, yeah. Or, or heart first. I mean, uh, there's a way that, you know, that in in some simple blues and rock styles, you can kind of there's a visual approach that people often take to the fingerboard and, the, and certain patterns and, and shapes and notes, you know, will give you the right notes, you know, but there's a difference when, when a player is playing with the musical idea first, and then they're executing what they're imagining in their head. Exactly. Uh, so they're not surprised by what they play. You exactly. know? I mean, that may be fun. And sometimes it is fun to tune the guitar different and just see what happens, you know, but, but, I always, I, I think I, I find players who, like I said, are are playing head first, uh, more compelling because it's you're hearing the the person. You're not hearing. It's not a rote thing, you know. It's, uh, you know, I mean, you you could probably teach a chimpanzee to <laughs> hit the right <laughs> notes, you know. But 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 um, but you know when somebody when you know somebody could sing, I mean, a perfect example is George Benson. Listen to him. I mean, I mean yes. he he proves that it's head first every time he starts to sing along with with there, and, he, and he can sing the most ridiculous, like advanced kind of lines, you know. And he and he's yeah, you know, that's just unbelievable. And but you know, like he he owns that. He, it's not. This is not just. A surprise. Is he, this isn't random. This is this is what he wants to sing and to play. You know, and it's really you're hearing him from the inside. First, sure. You know, you know what I mean. So yeah. It's not, there's no. There's and, and that's why his his technique, which is awesome, always feels in service of the music, never out there on its own first. You know, and I just always find that so much more beautiful. You know. So. Yeah, it's cool to hear the the, the dynamic like like your. I think your uh, variety comes through in the, the different projects you pursued because, you know, we were listening to, to some of your solo stuff a few days ago. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, I mean, I, it, we really enjoyed it. It's got more of this kind of bluesy rock, like almost like a Robin Ford type vibe to it. But then you hear you play in, in the context of Steely Dan, which is a whole different approach. You yeah, know, it's very different, yeah. And it's... It's cool because it's one of those things where you can you can you can see how you're thinking about it, and your there's a clear line from from you know 
from your head and what you're trying to say and what's getting communicated out to the listener. And, you know, I think that sometimes, like, back to your point about when the musician is guessing a little bit about what they're going to play, <laughs> there's right. this, there's this, there's this kind of the audience is guessing too, and some people love that. <laughs> oh, yeah, I guess so, yeah. But then there's this <laughs> thing when you're, when you know what's coming next because you're having, it's uh, improv is like, or uh, just soloing in general is a conversation. So when you're aware of what you're about to say, it makes the line of communication much more clear. So the point you're trying to get out becomes more clear. So when you can approach music and impro improv in the same way, I think it's an important thing for a lot, of, especially musicians, because we, we kind of want, to have that conversation, whether we're listening or participating, we want to feel like we're there with you. So for us, less of the guessing game and more of like, tell me what you're trying to say, you know. And it well, you know, clarity of communication is is you know, it's it's a. I appreciate that, and and I, I mean, I I I stumble, you know, often when I'm improvising, but 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 that's what I'm aiming for, and because that's what I like when you know when I hear somebody that feels beautiful and compelling to me it's usually because yeah they're succeeding i mean i mean I, i'm okay i mean improvising is it's it's a high risk game you know and uh and so you're you know it's you can't have the same high expectations of it uh as you can for something that you know you're able to work over again and again like a composition that you're able to sort of you know, tweak until you know it's done and it's right. You know, and then then like let let the world hear it. Improvise. It's it is a it's a riskier game, and so you, you, I think you'd be it'd be very self defeating to sort of try to apply too high a standard to that. On the other hand, you know, there are players who really, you know, are doing a lot more finding than searching when when they play, and those are the ones you wanna you wanna try to sound like and like. The, the, you know, my life in, as an improviser has been to try to like, okay, how do I do that, and how do I get better at that? And I think most most of it is, uh, for me, it, it mostly it's just experience with the material, and uh, yes, it, it totally, helps man. greatly to have the same band. It helps when they're a great band, <laughs> and uh, but it, but mostly it's familiarity with the, the material, and like sometimes for me, it, it actually requires you know stopping time sitting down in in my room to sort of figure out like okay well why is this difficult or like how could this be better what kinds of things you know would would work better than the kinds of things that naturally occur to me so sometimes it's important to to not just sort of try again live you know but to take it home and like try to figure out like okay what kind of approach does this particular song need you know what how can and i've done that with i mean that's that was sort of a, kind of a light bulb moment for me, I and mean, we like an aha moment when um, after uh, didn't happen the first year or the second year with Steely Dan, but after we had done maybe the beginning of the third or fourth tour, and the beginning of my work with them, the tour was like maybe every three years we would play, not every year. It it the pace picked up over time, but but so maybe like maybe 10 years after the first gig, but like maybe the third tour or something, you know, the, the light bulb went off when I said, Oh, like I can like listen to recordings of everything I've done on the, on the prior tours on these songs. I can say, okay, I can critique myself with a lot of perspective, you know, years, like years have gone by. So I said, okay, well I like that, you know, but, that's not so good. And say I could do, I could find something better than that. So I would, I would take these these tunes that had solo opportunity, improvising opportunities for me, and I would, you know, look back and say, okay, that yeah, that that approach works, or that one doesn't. I need something more for this one, and I would work. You know, I'd, I'd do my homework, and uh, and then I'd have an opportunity again with like a high stakes opportunity where I'm getting paid well to do it, fantastic band, fantastic technical help, an expectant crowd, like another like packed house. I mean, this is like, that's <laughs> when all that stuff sort of, um, you know, coalesces at the same time. It's, it's, that's unbelievable opportunity if you, if you can do the work to, to take advantage of it. Of course. And it again, again, it reminds me of George Benson, because a friend of mine, uh, drummer I worked with for many many years um, lives out in uh, in Jersey near the 
just over the George Washington Bridge, really. And George Benson had a house nearby there for a while, and he, he had a little setup to play with a B3 and a drum set in, in, his, in his basement or something, and uh, George did. And, um, and he would regularly invite friends over to play. Well, one day, the drummer that he usually used wasn't able to make it, so my friend Frank got the call to, to do it. And uh, so he went, he went to George's fancy house and... Alpine, New Jersey, or wherever it was, and rang the doorbell, and and George answered with a guitar around his, his neck, and he's playing. You know, he just never stopped playing. You know, he was a guy who, you know, he's now there's a specialist for you. Of course, he's he's played the same type of guitar setup. You know, uh, playing on the same types of tunes. You know, since he was a teenager, I'm sure, and maybe earlier, and uh, you know. But he's always working at it. Like he's ta- he, he knows the opportunity of conditions that are repeated all the time. Well, that, that F blues we're going to get to play again or, like, or whatever. You know, like, um, you know, it's, it's, he, he always knew that there was more he could do. And, and he rose to the occasion and he was playing all the time, you know. So, I mean, he's also, he has most astounding natural ability right. he's also i think a natural athlete you know so he's got all that going for him too so it's like i'm a, I'm a mere mortal but uh, <laughs> but he's um but you know that, that but he it's not just all that talent you know it's it's time it's and, and work, it's yeah. creative response to repeated opportunities that are similar so for me like finally having that steely dan gig with the same tunes Lots of lots of solo space, a great band, time after time. Like I said, good conditions. Where I mean, you couldn't come up with more reasons to to sort of be excited about responding to those opportunities. That's all I mean. So it's just fantastic. So that, I'm just more grateful about it every every year. You know, just and I realize that okay, that's that's and actually, if in a funny way, that. Even though I had given up the idea of me as a specialist, it ended up sort of being an opportunity because it was repeated and because the conditions were so appealing, you know, that I kind of, I sort of began to sort of hear something that that kind of does feel like, oh, this is how I play, you know, like, and then that got on some of the records too, like uh, from time on my hands on, I tried to sort of, I think, I think I, I got a lot of it on that particular record of mine that, uh, you know, there was something that I was realizing, okay, well, this, this is sounding like me. This is, you know, like, and I never, before I was always saying, okay, well, I'm going to try to sound like a jazz player on this tune or try to sound like, like try to sound like George Benson in this, in this, in this genre, try to sound like Carlos Santana in this genre or whatever, you know? Right. And, and, and a lot of those, like, a lot of that stuff's kind of just gone away, and and the the, the edges between them are, are all sort of smoothed out or something. And 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 I, I guess I think the reason that is was because that opportunity was presented to me, and I and but over the same over the course of years, you know, that was just fantastic. I mean, the issue for me that was disappointing for a while when I was kind of just doing more session work and and more work of different variety uh, th- there was something nice about the variety it was always kind of interesting but you know it was hard to feel like I was growing in a particular way I remember like my, my favorite example is, is is thinking about like I got a call one day for for a recording session and say hey we need we need a we need an uh, Need somebody to overdub a guitar in rockabilly style. So I said, well, yeah, I, I, I can do that. So I, you know, I took the gig and got on the phones to find somebody I could borrow a Gretsch guitar from. I, I got a Brian Setzer record out. I <laughs> started, started like boning up, you know, the night before, you know. Oh, boy. And, then, and so I, I got through it, you know, I got through the session. It was all right. You know, it doesn't sound like Brian Setzer, but it was close enough and they were happy. And, but then, you know, I didn't get another chance to play rockabilly guitar for like probably a year and a half or two years later maybe I get another call oh well this yeah we're looking for a rock maybe it would happen again you know well you don't get any better at at anything doing that right you, know? you get better at maybe you know i mean your your sight reading might get better although almost nobody 
writes for guitar anymore. <laughs> but, um, Thank God. And you're, and you're, you know, you're, you're sort of quick, you know, your, your ability to sort of be on your toes and responsive and quick, that, that, that it, those skills definitely go up if you're doing different kinds of work all the time. You have to kind of sort of be on it, which is, and that's good for you. But in terms of what I find more, more fulfilling musically, uh, the idea of, of sort of, you know, developing a, a a personal voice, you know, on your instrument over time, you know, that's, that's a little harder to do. And, and it doesn't happen with, with a freelancer's job like that. It only happened for me once, once I committed to uh, my own band and also, you know, the, this figured out a way to approach the Steely Dan gig as, as a player and then tried to sort of merge those worlds to some degree. And, and that felt like, okay, so it, it requires a real sort of what I think of as real music, opera, you know, situation, not uh, not the uh, music for hire thing as much. You know, so I guess it's yeah. When somebody's hiring you for you know when you're it's 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 cool to be in a scenario where you can um, hone your voice, and then the calls that you start to get are because they want your voice on well, it. Well, that's fantastic. You know right? exactly. Yeah. If that, if you can get to that point, that's a beautiful thing, and then and then life becomes a lot, a lot uh, feels more unified and feels more rewarding and just totally and probably easier, but 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 more natural, you know. So yeah, and and when you're if you're really working for someone else, and uh, I mean, and you're not called because of some some something they recognize that they want but just for your general skills then you you know you're really forced to sort of you know you're expected to play what they want you to play yeah, and sound the way they want you to sound so, and you know that that's a beautiful thing too some people are great at doing that yeah and, totally uh, but for me like i said the, the 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 thing that felt elusive about that was was any sort of uh, of that feeling that like I was getting any closer to like these these individuals that that I revere you know just who who were my favorite players who were all very I mean some of them might have done other things but but I never you know you never heard anything else that they did that it was it was a very focused sort of personal thing you know totally. and I think it makes sense it's probably probably how uh it most often has to be to, to sort of to develop that voice. You have to, you have to sort of kind of only do that. You know, totally. I'm curious about the um, the environment because this is a big part in discovering your voice and and who you are as an artist and a musician. You know, if you're in a band um, that that you've started or you're kind of you know a democratically run situation where everyone's got a, a voice and everyone's writing this and that that's the obvious way but then there's jumping into a scenario where that environment is cultivated for you to thrive as an artist and your voice is encouraged to be brought to the table do you it, it must feel if you if you found this for yourself with steely dan it must feel like they've cultivated this environment for you is that is am i right in, in that or is it very much just kind of playing the parts that are already written well I was quite surprised when I when I first joined Steely Dan just because I I mean I found it overwhelming like all I all the music I had to learn uh, like uh, so quickly um, just because we we didn't have a lot of rehearsal time and and I I could have used a lot more than I, than we had and I just I just jumped in and did the best I could but I was kind of very frustrated and disappointed in the beginning uh, that that Donald Walter had virtually no instruction for me. Yeah. They didn't <laughs> tell me what they wanted, you know. And 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 at first that really felt like a problem for me because, like, I kind of I kind of wanted direction and wanted help. I you know, <laughs> I was like I said, I was overwhelmed. But my God, like, how great! that was and they've always been like that i mean that is unbelievably rare i think you know and and strange when you consider the reputation they have like for record making you know which is like like nitpicky about details and you know every note in place you know fussy about performances and all that they i mean so i guess i i mean 
I still am scratching my head about it because I don't really understand why it was that way. But, but, um, and, and so I figured, well, I mean, in the absence of any instruction or direction, you know, I guess I'm going to have to decide, like, to play this the way it. I think it ought to be played, you know. And I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll either die by the sword or live by the sword, you know. So I figured, like, in a year, you know, okay, I mean. The three, the three guitar players who'd played with Steely Dan on tour the decade before I started uh, had each lasted one tour only. And uh, I figured that was likely to be my fate as well, you know. So I said, well, I said, imagining all this, uh, because I was, I was thinking about this, I said, well, I, got a ch I guess I have a choice here. I could either try to guess what I think they'd like from me, or I can just try to do the most natural job that feels right to me and make make the choices that make sense to me and at least if if they fire me at the end of this tour and i'm done i never work for them again at least i will have given them my my natural best you know and i won't won't have been confused about trying to you know i won't have like said well i think they'll like this you know in other words i trusted myself and i said okay that's got to be the best way to go and if they don't like it, then that's fine. Then I don't have to feel bad, and and I've I will have had one nice year, and that'd be great. Well, you know, this is twenty some years later, and so so I guess I guess for whatever reason, trusting my own instincts paid off, you know, and um, and I can only remember one time. This is another story I've told before, so sorry if anybody's heard it before. But it's very funny to me. He uh, Donald, uh, one time we were sound checking and we hadn't played hey 19 in maybe maybe at least months maybe years and uh so it wasn't in the set list for a while and uh but he wanted to wanted to work it in again and so we he called it during sound check to run and and so it has that little guitar thing into being you know and and i just i just didn't remember it you know and so i wanted to play it because it's kind of kind of signature and it's it's part of the song to me and more even though it was probably improvised uh we've heard it so many times and it was such a hit that i wanted to play it and but i just didn't remember it so i i kind of faked my way through it and and at the end of the <laughs> sound check donald donald comes over a little reluctantly he's kind of like he's got his head down he's kind of slouching he's he's kind of coming he goes hey john you know you know the beginning of that you know, in Hey 19, the, the beginning, ah, forget it. And he turned around and walked away. <laughs> so he couldn't even bring himself to, to direct me there. You know, like he just, I, I don't know. They're, they're, he's, they're, they're just amazing that way. They, once in a great while, they'll say something to somebody about, you know, the part they're playing or something, but but almost never. I mean, they like, they always wanted high musicianship standards they wanted things in tune in time they wanted to feel good sound good you know all those musical values they're absolutely they're fussy about those things but they they did not want to tell anybody what to play well there's so, there's a certain comfort and I'm, I'm certain that you can relate to this having at this point run your own band and been kind of, kind of the, the artist in charge um, and I've certainly experienced it in my uh, in my endeavors in that capacity. And there's a certain kind of thing where you don't want to have to tell people what to play, because, sure. because like there's <laughs> it it frees you up to be more involved and focused on what you're doing. If I have to sit there and think about what the drummer's playing, what the bass player's playing, what the piano player's playing, then it's it's I can't do my job effectively. So if it's almost like if I'm not saying anything, that's the best compliment that you can get. <laughs> and and second off, it's like I I would welcome the confidence. In fact, it's almost required to have the confidence for this gig to to trust your instinct on, on yes. it because yeah. that's that's what ultimately is gonna make for the best creative experience, I think. I think you're right. And and I just had not been in situations like that enough to be able to trust it, you know, and, uh, and, and I, but that was a fantastic opportunity again for me because this was, he was, they were both giving me this clear opportunity to sort of, okay, 
you got it you know it's it's up to you you know and we're not we're not we're not here to help we we you got to bring it and and so you know it took me a few years to uh, to for me to to feel good about what i how i was playing the gig but uh but even the first year i guess must have been good enough for that so so i i, I survived to to have those repeated opportunities which were really a, a life-changing thing for me so uh, how do you yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't have it any other way like as far as people you know i, I mean that, that's always better when you can find the right combination of people who each are are really going to bring you know i mean there has to be some uh, you have to have some agreement about what you're up to but of course but yeah it's fantastic when you can trust every player to take care of business and that it works in the big picture too it's fantastic totally and i, I know we're running short on time here but i wanted to just get to it real quick and just kind of see because i'm i'm always fascinated by this for people that are wearing multiple hats and involved in different things um what you know your experience with steely dan and in other uh scenarios where you've played with big artists how is there is there some of that experience that you carry into your own band as a band leader um you know good or good or otherwise where where you're like, okay, I see what's happening here. I don't want this to happen in my band, or I do want this to happen in my band. Is there anything that you're carrying or taking away from your experience as a side guy operating at the at the highest pop levels um, to you know maybe a more modest like you know band leader approach? That's a tough one. They, they feel so different to me. Um, I mean, I, I've been grateful for the the sort of way they feel so different, but they do feel so different to me. Like, like the idea of, you know, my own band. Uh, first of all, like first being the front person, you know, being the being the singer, you know, uh, sort of having written the songs, you know, like it's it's so different from from a job as a side man, and and I get, especially with Steely Dan. I get to be, I get to just play the guitar, you know, and when my band, that, that that's almost sort of like a, a very small part of it, even though that it's 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 what I want to be sort of the focus. Totally. But because of the nature of the other responsibilities, you know, um, you know, uh, it feels like a small percentage of what I'm dealing with. But on so in, in some ways, the Steely Dan thing is is beautiful that way because. I really get to just just play the guitar, you know, and and that feels like plenty on that gig, you know. Occasionally, when I've had to like sing something, it's like, oh man, this is this is a lot. You know? Yeah, <laughs> like, it's it's better when it's just when I can just do the one thing, you know. And um, and of course, I've gotten used to it over the years. So. Sure. So I don't know if, if there's much I would. It's hard to sort of feel like. Uh, you know, there's they feel more different than they feel the same to me, which is is funny. You know, but I think it's just because the role is so different. You know, um, what about like in a leadership capacity, like in because obviously you have your band leaders and they're going to be they're going to run their operation a certain kind of way, and then being uh, and obviously <laughs> there's no details that you don't have to. There's you can spare whatever details you want, but I'm just curious because I've been in scenarios where I've been. Um, the side guy, hired gun, just guitar player, and then I've been the band leader and the tour right. manager and the whole thing. And I often will pull from my experience as a side guy and saying this band leader crushed this aspect, <laughs> right, but maybe right, not right. so much in this way. So how can yeah. I improve on that? You well, know? that's good. If you're if you're able to do that, that's fantastic. I, I mean, I I hope I've been able to do that. Although it, it again, if, because it feels so different, they don't. I don't know that I. I, I think about it like that, right? But I certainly hope, and, and I think I mean, with with the bass player I work with regularly, um, you know, I I've learned that I can trust him, and I don't, you know, like, and, and this, I mean, sometimes, you know, in a rehearsal, like, somebody will point out, like, oh, well, something wasn't happy. We better do this again, you know. But I've realized, I mean, been t sometimes I've been lucky enough to be able to like rehearse with the steely dan rhythm section alone with with no no leaders just just the rhythm section no no horns no singers just before the before the rest of the 
like, like for a couple of days sometimes before, in the beginning of a rehearsal phase, you know. And it's fantastic because I know everybody in this band, I, you can trust everybody in the band wants to, wants to sound great. And if, if, if I hear like a flub on some instrument, you know, when, when we're doing this, we're running through a tune, yeah, I don't have to stop and say, you know, you know, you know that the, the eighth bar of that bridge, you know, you, 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 I think you played something. You better check that. They don't need you to do that right. ever. Right. <laughs> they know they made the mistake there. They're going to fix it. It's not going to happen on the gig. That's what the rehearsal is great for. It will point point all those things out to every player. And with a band like Steely Dan, you don't need anybody to to say, oh, you know that, uh, you, know, you got to fix that. No, that, you never have to go there. And I realize, I mean, I mean, of course, the people you want to play with all the time are like that, you know. And uh, and yes, I, the bass player in my band, I mean, we're just working as a duo now. So, so he, he's a guy I can trust that way. I, I don't have to tell him, you know. He I, Even if I hear something, he screws it. He knows, he, he knows. knows. Yeah. He's going to fix it, you know. And, uh, and you know, sometimes accidents happen sometimes they're just <laughs> accidents <laughs> right and they don't and that you don't need to comment on either you can chuckle at it you know but uh, right right yeah it doesn't have to be you know so i think I, I think actually that's one thing i mean i think i've learned uh not to be quite so reactive and quite so critical because i'm like that with myself and uh uh so it's it's it'd be easy for me it was easy for me to sort of try to apply my standards to everybody around me and not let them work in the most comfortable way for them, you know. And I don't think I do that as much anymore, which is it's it's partly just maturity, I think, too. It took for me sure. a while. But but uh it's it's definitely better and I, I hope I've learned that. I think I'm better at that. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, John, thank you. I know we've run out of time. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, talking to you today. I, I could go on for days. I'm so curious about how the enterprise <laughs> runs at that at that uh, level. Um, but well, I, maybe we'll get another chance. I, yeah, I've been, it's been fun. Uh, thank you, Anton. It's yeah. good, good, good to meet you, and good, good to be here. Thanks, man. Well, um, yeah, and greatly appreciate it. And uh, good luck with everything that you got going on. We'll be keeping up with you, and hopefully, see you guys in Jacksonville soon. I hope so too. All right. All right, man. Take, Take it care. Easy. Bye. Bye.